do you advise people, especially farmers, to partner with others? When you say addicts, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand what I mean. Can you advise on how to go about partnering with addicts? Because for instance, I live abroad, have some capital and looking for a local partner. So I think the person wants to know, you know, as farmers, maybe forming corporations, like you mentioned, um, pooling in resources from here and there. Would you advise farmers to go with that, especially with those that are low on funds? Oh, definitely. Um... That, that's more like um, investing in farms, right? If I'm right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it is important, right? Um, you know, for, for farmers, uh, we pull off pull, uh, pulling funds, either from equity, from venture capital, um, from even from personal from personal finances, from friends and families or crowdfunding, Farmer. right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you have so many uh, avenues for you to, you know, um, to get funding for your farm. And it is important. So if you have the funds and then you look to see a farm that uh, uh, we want to invest in, oh, that's fine. Uh, but it is very important that we invest in the right farm, right? And I don't like um, when you invest in a farm and um, there's this, okay, I've invested in a farm, I'm waiting for returns. No, um, sometimes your, your knowledge about business can help the farmer. Because for, for we farmers, there's still these, farmers are seeing agriculture as, Oh, it's my passion. It's like what I do. What my father gave to me as a job that I have to do. We are still telling them that agriculture is business. You still have to do it as a business, right? So if you are investing in a farm, ensure that you are investing in the right farm. Right? I encourage people to do that. Um, encourage them, them to pull in funds. Encourage ensure that you, you are investing in the right farm, and you are also involved in the management. You don't have to involve in the day to day. Uh, but see what is happening, get reports, advice based on your own experience. And then I think um, that will really help a lot. Great, uh, thank you for that. So we are wrapping up right now and um, um, we've talked about so much, right? From inputs to technology, to partnerships and everything we've talked about. So yeah, I'm happy with it. And for farmers on here, like Mr. Kintobi said, partnerships is important forming the part, the right kind of partnerships is, is one of the things that is really going to help you to um, expand your agribusiness and Complete Pharma seeks to do that with our partnership. So you can sign up on our grower model to become part of our grower platform to receive the needed assistance and support that will help you to expand your agribusiness. So as we round up, um, I'd like to know your final words on the issue of understanding seasonalities as farmers, we talked about the input, we talked about market prices. Mr. Mohammed spoke so much about weather and how technology can be used in those aspects. So which advice would you give existing farmers and even new farmers that are struggling with trying to understand seasonalities and what to do as exactly to meet demand? Yeah, I think anyone can go. Uh, Mr. Jonas, you can go ahead. Yeah. Um... Understanding seasonalities um, when producing, like we said, across the sub region, we have two main weather conditions, the wet season and the dry season. Usually in the, dry, in the wet season, around this time, around the, the southern belt, we are all planting, around the southern belt, we are planting now. At the point in harvesting, at the time we are harvesting, in June and July, I'm talking about grains. At the time we are harvesting, it is still raining. So we advise farmers to use aflacine uh, to against aflatoxin because your grains might be infected or you dry after harvesting to reduce infestation of aflatoxin in your, in your, in your grains before you sell. This will reduce, uh, if, if you don't control aflatoxin in your grains, you can't sell. The quality of your produce will go down and then you get lower prices for your produce. Yes, I think this is my final words to farmers. Uh... Great, thank you, um, Mr. Kintobi and Mr. Mohammed can go. Okay, I think Mr. Mohammed can go, yes. Yeah, uh, so uh, what I wanted to say, what's the most important thing is knowledge. You have to seek that knowledge, find that knowledge either uh, through your own research or find companies like Complete Farmer to help you with it. Uh, I, I would just like to, like end this with with only one thing that I wanted to say is what matters is is getting the highest yields with a minimum cost 
And this is something that we can actually work with through our platform. So thank you for bringing me here. And I'm very happy actually to listen to everyone in here. Yeah. Uh, thank you to you for being part of us. And I'm happy you talked about, it's about increasing your yield in a cost-effective way. Yes, we had this, a conversation about it yesterday as well. So yeah, I'm happy you talked about it. And I thank you very much for all that you shared on technology. And Mr. Kins will be your final words before we wrap up. Yeah. Yeah, so seasonality in agriculture is, um, is, is, is normal, right? Right, uh, because um, all these produce um, have their seasons. Uh, but what we can do is to overcome that seasonality uh, by making sure that we have um, uh, strategies in place that we can uh, that make, enable us to produce all year round. And so, um, but if you don't have that um, opportunity to produce all year round, um, you can as well, you know, look at opportunities or strategies or um, existing platform that can even give you more value for your produce, um, like complete farmer, you know. And um, what I'll just say is that, um, thank you for having me here. Um, it's nice to listen to Mohamed and Jonas. Um, and I'm glad to, uh, to share my own uh, little knowledge about agriculture. Thank you. Yeah, thank you too for joining us. And our, our attendees can find you to network as well, because uh, most people are talking about how to get interactive with Mr. Kintobi. Mr. Mohammed, he has social media channels. We can also get interactive with uh, Mr. Jonas as well. Great. Uh, so I think Mr. Mr. Kintobi's uh, Twitter is Niger Farmer. So our attendees can check him as well. Thank you very much for being here and thank you for everything you shared. I believe that most farmers are living here with the confidence and the right knowledge that they need in their agribusinesses. And personally, I learned a lot and I'm definitely I'm going to share with whoever I can because there's so much for farmers to learn. Thank you once again. And this was an interesting session. So uh, to our attendees, our next session is definitely one you can't miss. We are going to talk more about how to brand your business. Mr. King Toby and all our panelists talked about uh, the importance of pricing, the importance of knowing your market. All those things are things that farmers should know. Now, our next set of specialists are supply chain experts, agribusiness consultants, people that work with farmers, that give farmers the right knowledge they need to expand their businesses. This year we are expanding. So if you're a farmer who wants to expand your agribusiness to create the right strategy for yourself this year, this next session is for you. So don't forget that we'll have a raffle draw at the end of today's session where we are going to give amazing prizes to people who stick to the very end of the event and to others who have shared on social media as well. So whilst we wait for, um, whilst we wait for all our all our panelists to join. Please send your messages as well. And if you are having issues with um, signing up with the Grower platform, please drop your email address on the group, uh, on the chat page, and you'll be contacted after the event. So our email uh, website is www.completepharma.com. Check there to sign up to our Grower platform. And as we get ready for our next set of panelists. Please know that our grand model is live. So if you're a farmer who is looking for an opportunity to increase your crop yield, to export to the international market and to also receive constant agronomic support, Complete Farmer is here for you. Simply sign up to be part of our grand model. If you're also a buyer, wherever you are in the world, if you're looking for an opportunity to source commodities, you are looking for a seamless channel from production right to delivery, Complete Pharma is handling that for you. So um, check out our buyer model as well.
Yes, uh, so it's time for our next session. So stick and stay to win these prizes to see what is in our mystery box. We have a special box for people that stay to the end of today's events and also those who share on social media. So we are packing our gift box to give out. And our second session, our last session for the day is ready now. We have our guests joining in and I'll be co-hosting with, yes, I'll, my co-host is already here. So she'll take it from here. And please take and stay to the end to win discounts and prices from our partners. Hello, Antonia. everyone good afternoon um i'm excited to start and um, moderate this section with uh, my co-host uh, antonia can you guys hear me uh your voice is a bit low the sound is low so we are unable to hear it is better now can you hear me it's, it's still low Better? Can you be better now? Can you hear? Uh, I think the sound is still low from our uh, head. Okay. Well, our audience are saying it's better now, so we can continue. Okay. So if you cannot hear me, please just leave a message and I'll have to probably check okay. my uh, microphone. Okay, so my name is Antonia, and um, today we're going to be talking about um, shaping your international agribusiness strategy. Since yesterday, if you've been following the session or the webinar, you would understand that uh, we've talked about crop production, growing crop for the export market. We talked about financing. We talked about how to uh, how to use technology to improve your production, food production. So today we're, we're going to focus on how as a farmer or as a trader in the agribusiness uh, sector, how can you, uh, how, what plans, what do you do, what strategies, how do you get buyers, how do you connect to local buyers, how do you take advantage of global market trend, and then finally, how do you ensure that you have a seamless um, supply chain? So again, my name is Antonia, and I lead the business uh, development uh, efforts at Complete Farmer. At Complete Farmer, we produce crops and we process crops. We, uh, so we are involved across the supply chain for production to export of your commodities. So we have a, an area of panelists and this we would uh, be a specialist in the agribusiness um, sector. And you would be able to learn firsthand uh, from our experiences. And hopefully today you have, um, you leave this session with all the tools that you need to shape or map up your agribusiness strategy. So um, I will begin to introduce um, everyone in the section now. Um, so this is time for everyone. I cannot see some names. So I would start with Olabisi. Olabisi, could you please start um, by introducing yourself, please? Hello, Sarah, can you hear me? Hello, Antonia, um, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Olabisi Fagwimbo. I am an agribusiness consultant and um, I'm the principal agribusiness consultant for Frontier Harvesters Limited. I'm an agro influencer and I'm um, in love with the SDGs. I, I do everything in between in the agribusiness value chain, but more importantly, in the past couple of years, I have been extremely interested in an agribusiness mindset. Uh, in terms of agriculture or farming. And that's what I have been representing for a while now. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm not sure, but I think that the next guest would be Mr. Nicholas Amati. Am I correct? Yes, that's correct. Please, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Come again. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Introduce yourself. All right. So, um, Nicolas Amate is my name. I'm an agribusiness value chain specialist. For the past eight years, I've worked with smallholder farmers, 
uh, SMEs in the agribusiness sector. My main focus has been developing markets for such uh, actors within the agricultural value chain. Thank you. Okay, guys, thank you so much. So we're just going to quickly dive in into shaping the international agribusiness strategy. So my first question would be to you, Mr. Nicholas. Um, a lot of farmers, just during this webinar, we find that there are a lot of farmers who are looking to start exporting their commodities, okay? So what do you think would be the basic step? What's the first step to planning your agribusiness strategies? What resources should they have and how can they start um, planning to export their commodities? Thank you very much for this very important question. Um, I think a lot has been said about planning, but I still want to highlight the importance of planning in this space. Having a strategy to go international needs a lot of planning. And we normally have this saying that if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. We have three main keys that is very important finance, markets, and then the produce. Now, many people often say that finance is the first thing, but the importance of what we are doing is that who are you selling the produce to? So it is the market. So for you to be able to have the market and even make a decision of what to grow and where to send it, you need to conduct a market research. So we are assuming that that has been done. What goes into the market research? Having decided on which value chain you need to uh, embark on, there are a number of things that you need to look at. So yesterday they talked about the, all the, the selection of the crop, the requirements, but one key thing I want to highlight is the risk associated with your production activities. You have identified the risks how are you able to manage those risks? That is very important. Now let's come back to the substantive question. Every market has a requirement. And so for you to get connected to a, a, a market, you will want to find out what are the requirements of that market. So for example, the export market, what are the consumers looking for in the various products that you have decided to produce. One of the things I want to talk about has to do with uh, standards. Standards, I'm making specific reference to certification and then traceability. There are a lot of opportunities in the export sector, but as an individual, you need to have these standards or processes in place. So all these are part of the planning process that you need to look at and ensure that it is part of your plan which you want to implement. Thank you so much. So I would uh, move this question to Sarah Olabisi. So um, now that Nicholas has told us about planning, you know, uh, putting your resources together, my next question to you would be, how do you make this a brand? How do you put all these resources together and make it a brand that is appealing to your audience, whether it's domestic audience or international audience? Um, Antonia, thank you for that question. It's really a very, very essential um, thing to consider. Uh, for starters, I would say, um, there's something we call like a, a division or um, picking a niche in the value chain. I think, well, I don't, I don't exactly have statistics to back it up, um, but I think farmers or agribusiness people who, who, who create niches for themselves have done best in the value chain. I always say, um, it's not that easy, especially when you are a small or growing uh, company or an SME agribusiness agri company to want to do everything. You know, produce, it's 
we all know production is really like time consuming, labor consuming, and you still have to process, you still have to brand, you still have to market. So that's where my point today will come in. I would say partnership is the best way to go about it. There's a lot of people saying, oh, there are no jobs, you know, young people looking for jobs. I feel that um, if I'm not saying companies should not, you know, do all around the value chain, it's nice. But I think if most people can partner instead of having to worry about the branding, it makes life easier. So that being said, I would say uh, branding should be market specific or target market specific you have to study your consumers. For instance, there is a particular uh, uh, product or brand we are trying to bring into the UK here. And um, we were saying we would have to have about two different categories of, uh, three different categories of branding. Because I was telling people that even I personally, this particular product, I wouldn't want to spend too much on one of it just because the brand, the, the branding is better. Because at the end, what really is in it is what I'm interested in that. I know it's the same thing in the three different brands. I'll just go for the middle one, not the cheapest one, but the middle one because I feel it's still nice enough to look at and I'm able to get what I want in it. So I think it's market specific. We need to, and it boils down to what uh, Mr. Nicholas has just said, that the first thing in agribusiness is your market. Study your market. You can't be in a low income um, society, you want to sell um, um, maybe fufu or something to them, and you you decide to go for a branding that is for you know an international market, or maybe for uh, Africans in diaspora. In as much as everybody loves to have you know nice packaging or nice um, a look for their food, but in situations in so certain socioeconomic situations, we are more concerned about what we are actually going to get in it to eat to fill our bellies than actually how beautiful it's going to look in our kitchens or in our fridge. So I'll say the first thing is you know division of labor uh, partnership, partnership, and secondly a market study, like knowing what's going to work in the market you're targeting or that you're selling to. I hope I answered the question. Yes, you did very well. It was very well answered. So this was your answer would actually take me to our next question, which is um, understanding market trends, right? So when I speak with a lot of farmers or a lot of businesses, they really want to export, but they have no idea where to export their commodities. So um, if you're here, you're a farmer, as, Chidima, as Sarah has said, and as Nicholas has said, please take your time to do basic research. Partner with people, go to websites, go to trading association and learn the basic market trends. So um, you understand your product that you want to sell and then you can also define the market. And even in that, your market, you can also define your segment. Who in that market, like Sarah said, in the UK, there's a product. Who in that market does this branding appeal to? It would actually help you in shaping your agribusiness strategy. So Sarah, um, the next question would be to you. Um, you talked about partnerships, right? So for um, farmers in West Africa, we know that data is a problem. What areas, where do you think they should look out for, look to, to get um, data, to get research, market trends and market information? What, what channels can they find this information? Thank you, Antonia. Um, yeah, you already, I think, even in the question, you have given an answer, which I will just elaborate on. Data is really an issue in Africa for so many reasons. And uh, it, it all boils down to the fact that probably we are not um, putting enough of our resources into research and innovation in Africa. That's why data is an issue. But that being said, um, I would advise uh, some of our organizations, I think a lot of us just know we see organizations we know what they stand for, but probably we are not really uh, putting them to work. You know, most of these organizations, I don't want to mention them, but um, these government organizations that are put out there, you know, these research institutes, this, if, if uh, you, you pull them, if you give them a nudge, there is always data. It might not be accurate, but there is always data. Data is there. We are not just looking. We are not like putting the people whose jobs are to give us data. 
we are not giving them enough knowledge or putting them to work. We mentioned them in our tweets, in our Instagram, maybe for visibility or for engagement, but we are not really putting them to work. Um, also, I think uh, private, uh, the, the good thing is the internet is um, has given us some power. So if you really, really want to uh, get data, you're going to get it if you put your time to a little bit of um, investigation on the internet. If you go to res people's research work and, um, you know, Google Scholar and all that, you're going to find, um, I think during my dissertation last year, that was, uh, my supervisor said something and he told me, you know, there is nothing at all you want to write about or talk about that somebody has not written about or talked about. It's about you looking for it. So, and that was, uh, I, because I, I initially thought my topic was a bit streamlined and it was going to be hard. But by the time I put myself to work, I realized that there's even way too much information and I needed to start um downsizing and streamlining so if you really need data i i don't think data is an issue it's easy to find or maybe not so easy but if you put work to it but then again i'll still say it again that those organizations i don't want to mention their name but we know if you hold them to it they've got data that's what they do that's what they are paid for they've got data you hold them to it Instead of only just adding them in your tweets for retreat purpose or anything, hold on to them or look for, you know, there's always someone that is your mutual friend that works there or does research there. If you hold them, you're going to get data from them. I'm talking, and I'm talking from my personal experience. So data is available. It's just not all over, but you can get it if you put your mind to it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Sarah. Excuse me. Thank you so much. So Mr. Nicholas, do you have anything to add to that? Where would you suggest that um, people interested in the agribusiness, agri where can they learn, where can they monitor market trends? So uh, Mr. Nicholas, you're, um, you're, not, you're muted. Okay. Yes, I, I'm on now. So, um, Sarah mentioned partnerships. I will want to add it to developing a value chain and be part of the chain. You see, one reason why normally we see there is a difference between market availability and market accessibility. So the market is there, but how do you participate in the market? There are two things here. As I mentioned earlier, the market has a requirement. Do you meet that requirement? One of the requirements they normally look for is volumes and cost consistency, your supply. As someone who is entering into the agri space or someone doing it on a smaller scale, do you have the muscle? Do you have a strength to be able to meet that demand? No. And that is why you need partnerships to be able to ensure that you collectively achieve that goal and make your profits. It is not just partnership, strategic partnerships, partnerships that are transparent, partnerships that are free to share information with one another. That is the kind of partnership that we need to be able to do that. Now, with regards to getting information on this, there are a lot, and I'm happy that uh, Complete Pharma has initiated this because one of them has to do with participating in outgrower schemes like this. Yesterday, I heard them talking about having conducted a lot of research, and it is not just research, progressive research. And so every year, they keep improving and getting new information, and this data it's just not for them alone. They want to share with other people and that is why they've created that model. So that is one way that you as an individual, you look at what you can do. And then you also consider the ones you cannot do. What are the people or what are the entities that can provide such uh, gaps for me? And these are the people we need to partner with. So our grower schemes is one. 
Another one is that we have a lot of online platforms. Some are already exporters. And normally what they do is they go around to the farmers and they have to buy the products from them, repackage and sell. And that is why I was highlighting that if we have to uh, ensure that there is that kind of consistency and there is uh, the kind of uh, sustainability for our activities, all the parties, all the actors in the chain must be open enough not to squeeze one another to make profit for the other, but to be able to what? To have a discussion. What are the roles we are so, supposed to play in a team? And what are the benefits? What are the approach? What can we do? So once this discussion is done in a very transparent and healthy manner, you realize that the motivation to contribute to our part of the chain becomes possible. Another one is we have aggregator networks. So there are already people who are in the markets and they have uh, positioned themselves very well that they get the products and they sell. Sometimes they even get orders, orders ahead of the planting season. And so they are looking for farmers that they can engage in what we call contract farming. So you produce these volumes for me, let me know the kind of support you need to be able to do that. I will help you and I'll be monitoring what you do. At the end of the day, you get the product. Pricing is done prior to this engagement. So already you have your market. Then you can focus on the other activities, which is production, that you are very comfortable and capable of doing, instead of doing everything by yourself, which will stretch your resources. We also have product associations. Product associations, for example, in terms of exports for Ghana, I know we have the Federation of Association of Ghanaian Exporters. It is made up of about 19 different product uh, associations under it. And they have uh, a lot of information for specific agricultural products that is needed by the international community. And then government agencies, export promotion decks. Yes, they may not provide you everything that you want, but it is also a starting point where you can also get that kind of promotion to be able to uh, engage in that. Then the final one, it has to do with participating in domestic fests. In our local communities, either quarterly or yearly, we have what we call the Farmers Day, even prior to the Farmers Day, we have others that we showcase what we are doing. These are also opportunities that we can look out for to be able to get the markets that we need, either within or out. And until recently, the African continental free trade area is opening up a lot of opportunities for products and services. But we need to learn or know the requirements to be able to participate in such a market available. Thank you so much, Nicolas. So just to do a recap for the audience, it's very important that you partner, you know, have partnership within the industry, that's number one. And then um, as, Sarah, as Sarah has said, um, getting information from you know, the government agencies might be quite difficult, but you have to push them, send an email, talk to them, try to reach out to, to them. And then um, Nicolas, uh, concluded by saying that we should take advantage of the online resources. There are platforms online, you know, do your research, find those information, put them together, and then understand what trends, where should I put this product? What product should I plant this season? What product should I focus on this season? That's one way for you to be able to understand market trends and put them into your market strategy, particularly for trade. So I just wanted to also add that food business is very serious business, you know, and so if you're um, planning to export or trade internationally, you need to take this as a very serious uh, business. It's not something that you do because you don't have an alternative. You should be passionate about it and you should set a goal. So whether you're a small business here, you're a small farmer here and you want to export, it's very possible, uh, but you need to start small 
research, understand the sector, and then grow. As you begin to grow, then you can begin to expand your market reach. So that would take me to our next um, section, uh, my next question. It would be, everyone really would say, okay, I have the product, I have the market, I've done the research, I've branded, what next? I need buyers. How, who's going to connect us to buyers? This is the one question that everybody wants to, to you know, wants to get connected to buyers. So uh, how can we take advantage of the internet? You know, how, do, how can people get connected to global buyers? I'll just give an example. In West Africa, we do a lot of cashew nuts. We do a lot of soybean. We do a lot of cocoa bean. So let's assume that you have your product, even okra, mango, pineapple. How would you advise, Sarah, this would be to you. How do you advise them? Where would they get buyers? How can they get connected to buyers internationally? That's, uh, Antonia, that's another interesting question you asked yeah. me again. Um, we've got, to be honest, we've got a lot of fundamental issues that we need to fix. And um, there is this very old and popular saying that charity begins at home. First of all, yeah, exporting food is lovely. It's, it's a nice business. It's uh, very profitable, but I always ask, have we fed everybody at home? That's one. Then again, unlike most of our African countries, of course, things are getting better. I'm not trying to ridicule where we come from, but we really need to talk about our issues. That's when we can you know, get them fixed. Most of the things we produce are not, if you, most brands, that are in countries like the UK and America. We both, we all know that most of these brands, they, they could not come through the right channel and they had to like come in through different avenues. Why? It's simple. Uh, a lot of our production are not ethical enough and are not meeting up to standards. And I always say, if Africa, if there's a lot of hunger and malnourishment in Africa, why are we even exporting in the first place? And I know why people are looking at export markets. You won't blame them. People are businessmen, they are in business to make money and the market is not even, you know, encouraging enough. So I think a lot of things need to be, it's like that's why I said, the question is a very large question. A lot of things need to be fixed back home first, which is, um, we need to cure our food insecurity back home. First of all, um, there has to be, people have to have the buying power because people are hungry. We don't even have business exporting in the first place. People are hungry back home. So things, the situation of things need to be changed first. People have to, to, to have power to buy product. The truth is, exporting is stressful. If I have a good market for my product uh, uh, in, in Nigeria or in Ghana, I don't have a reason why I should export food in the first place. So first of all, I think, um, so I don't divert too, too much from the main issue or the main question. Um, I think, first of all, People, if people want to export, it goes back again to research and getting information. People need to um, ensure that their products meet specific food standards for the countries that they want to export to. And even before that, you need to first research what country needs your product, what specification. For instance, some, um, we've got lots of cocoa and, um, and um, uh, cashew nuts and coffee, especially in West Africa. But why are these countries taking more from some parts of East Africa instead? Because those people have been able to, you know, um, collaborate, partner with them and understand what the requirements are, what grade of these uh, cash products are. And they've been able to, to keep to that and integrity. It's one thing again for uh, buy, for for a company to come from UK or America to your farm and say, uh, Mr. Nicholas, I love your cocoa. Can I get this cocoa in this quantity? Uh, you know, at say, this say intervals, and the first time he gives them that grade of cocoa, 
And then <laughs> the next time, because they are not around to check it, he sends a different grade of cocoa because it's probably cheaper to produce that. I'm not saying Mr. Nicholas does that. You know, I'm just trying to explain yeah. what is happening. So a lot of things, that's why I said charity begins at home. I could keep listing and listing all the reasons why we are having difficulty. For instance, in the industry, my uh, main core, core, my core niche, which is a, a, a aquaculture fish farming, we are unable to bring catfish into the UK, except through, you know, if people, I don't do that, but people do that. We are unable to take it to so many countries because one, we 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 are we have been accused of um misusing antibiotics and many other things like that. Look at our beans as well, you know, they're complaining of too many pesticides. But me, I'll still keep saying, for me, I'll keep saying, okay. Have we even fed people at home? Is this also what we are feeding people at home? And we keep complaining that we are being resistant to antibiotics, uh, you know, and all. So it's, it's in so many faces. First of all, uh, if our economies can get better and people at home are able to afford our foods, we would have very little to export, to be honest. But then again, in, as I'm, now uh, that I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective of someone who, you know, is an, a, enthusiastic about development, about agriculture itself. But now as an agribusiness expert, I would say that for you to be able to export, first of all, you need to research what goes to which country, what does what country need, and you need to research the specifications that they need. When you do that, even, um, I'm sure probably Complete Pharma does this as well. The company I, I, I am with does that as well. Market linkage. There are companies like ours all over there. When you do your due diligence, you, you get the right ones and you'd be able to network. But first of all, do they want to buy what you have? So that's it. You get the, 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 the market is always there once you can provide what the market needs. So we need to research first what those markets need. Then we establish contact with, you know, Companies that you know that this you need to verify, not just go through the, some people because they want to be fast, they want it faster, they want it this way, that way. They go through, you know, people that would later like probably cheat them or take their money. We know, go to, you know, verified sources like this, you know, and negotiate and partner. And you'll be surprised that most of the, uh, um, the chain distributors in the UK and the US don't, they already have their cash. You don't need to spend so much on the importing. They already have their cash and their resources that they have what a place you take those products to and they take care of all the shipping and the stress if you go through the proper channel. So I don't, have I uh, been able to answer some of it because the question <laughs> has yeah, a lot of answers. So but. this question is very broad and this is the question that every exporter, every farmer, every trader has. Like this is the first thing. Forget everything, I want a buyer. So as you have heard Sarah said, getting a buyer is, it's not easy. So we're not saying that getting a buyer is easy, but we're saying that that should be like at the last step. There's so many steps, there's so many things that you need to do before you consider getting a buyer, before you consider speaking with a buyer. So you need to be prepared. And the preparedness before meeting a, speaking with a buyer, it's a lot. So a complete farmer, what we do a complete farmer is we have all these resources. We're farmers, uh, we support local farmers. We, we have an agronomist team. We have the whole resources really that we need to be able to export crops. And this is why we had we have our grow model, which is life. You can actually go to the website now, um, register if you're a farmer, you have a farm, and then we would actually have people speak with you to ensure that you're verified and you're ready to grow crops for export. But then again, Complete Farmer enables you, was supporting farmers, was supporting communities because despite all the challenges, it is important that we begin to grow food that we trade internationally. And then when we say internationally, it could be from Nigeria to Ghana, it could be from Ghana to Burkina Faso. With Acta, the Acta coming up soon, you know, it's already happening, right? We expect it to continue to increase regional trade in this sector. So again, if you would like to, if you have a farm, you would like to learn more about how you can grow crops, how you, how we, you can get, uh, take advantage of our market connectivity, please sign up on the platform. So uh, Mr. Nicholas, I want to move on to you. 
while Sarah was speaking, she talked a lot about verification of bias. She also talked about ethical standards and sustainability. These are key words that you would hear in the international market, right? So let's start with the verification of bias. How do you think that, assuming that um, there's a farmer listening to us now and there's someone saying, I want to buy your okra or your mango, what is the first step? What should he do to ensure that he's speaking to the right buyer? Well, um, before commenting on that, I want to touch on what Sarah mentioned. It is, it is very, very critical to consider this. You cannot move from, let's say, stage one, and then you get you want to be at the university. It is only few students, and it's not possible. It's only few students who can do that. Then again, you cannot run as a toddler. You cannot run without first learning how to crawl and take your steps. So for me, what I will encourage is that if you are new in the sector, learn from those who are redeemed. And that is why we have an initiative like this with Complete Pharma. They have the experience, they have the knowledge. And so rather than directing or looking for an individual buyer yourself, it is better to take advantage of some of these opportunities. For example, just some few days ago, between 5th and 7th, there was a, a fruit logistical event in Germany where global uh, market uh, actors meet to sell or to discuss if they have products, they send the products there, fruits and vegetables. And fortunately, members from Ghana went there. Some of them are selling okra, uh, mango, sweet potato and the lights. So these are associations that are already existing. So why reinvent the wheel when you know that you can get support from these entities? Now, if you want to go direct to have a discussion with someone online, you can verify from these same associations whether these people are really credible. That is number one. But again, they may have the requirements. Will you be able to meet those requirements at this stage? Is it not too high a risk for you to consider that, especially when in most cases you cannot even meet the volumes to supply? So why not learn from entities like Complete Pharma who already have a network of bias? And so yours will just be an addition and you focus on your production. That is what I can say for now. Um, yes, Nicholas, I actually like 100% agree with um, you and Sarah that finding buyers or meeting buyers, while it is very important, you want to sell, you want to generate foreign exchange, it takes a lot of processes. It can be really difficult for um, small scale businesses or small farmers. So uh, partnership is key. Work with your associations, your cooperatives, and then see into opportunities like um, the solutions that Complete Pharma is offering. It's easier for you to run with the support that organizations or companies, startups like Complete Pharma offers you as a small or growing business. Okay, um, so let's move to um, the supply chain, right? So on the assumption that you, 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 you uh, have a plan, you have a brand, you have done your research, you have been connected to a buyer, how do you meet your supply chain? This is something that um, a lot of us, a lot of farmers, we don't take this into account. Again, partnership, we don't see how do I ensure that I consistently meet this order? Right. So when you're building a brand, trust is important. I think Sarah talked about it. Like when you're building your brand, you need to be able to, people need to come to your website or go to your social media page and trust you. So one of the elements of trust is ensuring that you have a consistent supply chain. Um, could you please explain to us how can small farmers, how can they 
ensure that they have a consistent supply chain, whether for export markets or regional, international export markets, regional markets or domestic markets, how do you ensure that you have a consistent supply? Anytime somebody comes to you for products, you have commodities to sell to them. I, I, I think, Sarah, you should start with this. Um, again, I'll say the answer to the question is already in the question. And I think um, recently a colleague in the industry and I were having a chat and we were, we were saying a lot of people think that this agriculture space is about competition, is about I'm the one out there, oh, as long as I'm, oh, they need to see me. And, and it boils down again to the fact that I can understand in other sectors, but in this sector, we need to understand that this is a noble cause. Agriculture is a noble cause and it's beyond um, individual success, actually. It's about food security. It's about development. It's about um, humanity. So once again, it boils down to the fact that people need to start, start seeing one another in the industry as partners rather than competitors. It's not a competition. I'm saying it again that every one of us who are in the agri space, all put together, are not even enough to feed sub Saharan Africa. So um, there's nothing to, one is not disturbing another. Like we need to pull resources. So why would, um, because I'm, I'm planting cocoyam on my farm, and you, Anthony, are planting cocoyam on your farm next door, why should we be enemies? No. We don't even have it. You and I together don't have enough cocoyam to go around. So we need to start seeing this as a common cause and not as a competition. We know it's business here, yeah, but the thing is we don't even have enough to go around. So we need to start partnering. I, I know that, yeah, that, uh, you know, companies are doing, uh, it, to be honest, I would commend that, especially our generation, uh, we've been doing a lot, you know, going out there all out there on Twitter, on Instagram, putting good information out there for people, educating people, putting our product out there. But now it's now becoming uh, something that we need to understand is not about individual. It's not about, oh, what's Sarah's brand? Oh, Antonia's brand? Oh, Complete Farmer's brand? Oh, Nicholas's brand? We all can still achieve this aim by coming together. And again, not only a very small percentage of farming businesses in Africa uh, can actually be called large scale or commercial farm. The rest of us, we are still SMEs and we need to come together. And that's, see, I, I was telling, I, this is not totally related, but it, it's relatable. It was, it was one of my live sessions we were talking about um, um, how to you know, attract international or global funding to you know, startups like you know, innovation startups you know, and tech startups. And one thing that we talked about was still this thing called partnership. I told them, and I think my guest also told them that, do you know why most of the time startups that got uh, really, really like ma uh, massive uh, uh, support or you know, sponsorship, do you know that mo most of them, it's not usually a one man startup. It's usually, oh, three uh, African guys, say uh, one guy from Kenya, one guy from Ghana, and one lady from uh, somewhere in Egypt came together to build so, 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 so. And now uh, this so, so, so organization is, is funding them with $10,000. Have you noticed? People believe that as human, as a one person, as one person, you could easily lose focus. You could easily lose traction when entrusted with fund or any form of support. But people believe that all three of you will probably are less likely to go mad at the same time or go haywire at the same time. There will always be somebody retracting and regrouping us. And I personally as well, I know that I'll feel, I feel even way back in Nigeria when I was you know, trying to get into a company and all, I, was, I felt more comfortable working for multinationals or companies that you know had headquarters in different had headquarters somewhere branches in different places because I always believe that the, there's a, a little less um you know it's just always more coordinated when I see a group of people I want to do business more with a group of people than with one person so 
I think this is even enough for us to understand the power of partnerships. And even if you look at the SDGs, at some point in the end, it was still it boiled down to partnership for the goals. If United Nations that we all look up to and all this see an importance in partnership, I think partnership is the key. Would, let's just say that our topic for this uh, episode of this thing is just about partnerships. To be honest, once you are able to partner with good um, entities, good people, you the sky is only a starting point for you in whatever your niche or your business is. So we need to foster in um, partnerships, you know, that have loyalty, integrity, not that just, you just start because they say partnership, you just look for somebody, you know, verify people. And that's why when, even when I want to, you know, partner people to do things, employ people, and I keep asking them for their socials. And it sounds like intrusion. No, I'm not intruding. Even companies that do business with us and all that, you think they do their, it's called due diligence. Even when you are applying for visa from Africa, I know. When you're applying for visa these days, they ask for your socials. They want to see what you represent, your, 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 your opinion about certain things, certain situations. He helps people to be able to understand a little bit of your mind, of your, or your attitude to things, attitude to work, the way you manage funds and all that, the way you see your outlook on life. So, so that's, where, that's where I'll now go also. If I'm not talking for too long, I'll now go also to the fact that be represented. Gone are the days when you say, oh, social media is for this, it's, for this, it's only for, it's not for show off. You don't have to put your family there if you need your privacy. You don't have to, but please, we need to have more presence, you know, websites, um, blog there, you know, anyhow, and these days, websites are not that expensive to get. There are even hosting kind of, I don't know, it's not my field, but there are ways to make sure that what you do is out there with a little bit of transparency and, you know, people will be motivated to want to do stuff with you. That's what, what else I'll add to it. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. So um, if you would like to ask Sarah or Nicolas a question, please leave your questions in the comment section because we're about to round up this session and we would ask them and they'll be able to um, reach out to you or respond to your questions. And then also, um, if you would like to also, if you're having any issues or with the buyer platform, technical issues, you cannot log in, please leave your email addresses and someone from our team will also contact you to help you resolve that challenge. So Mr. Nicholas, do you, would you like to add on aggregation? How can um, farmers ensure seamless supply chain? How can they ensure that they always have supply? So supply chain is part of the value chain, more focus on the market because it relates to how you ensure that your produce is available at all times for the consumer and at his or her convenience. And again, this goes back down to planning. How can you plan your production activities in such a way that you can always have produce to supply. So let me take just an example. Like you're, pro, you're a maize producer and you supply maize to a number of buyers. And you know the maize production takes about three to four months. So within a whole year, if you have all the resources, you should be able to have a kind of a good irrigation system to ensure that you produce throughout the year, maybe about three or four times. In that way, you can ensure that you have the produce available. The other aspect you have to look at is the packaging and the logistics before the product gets to the person. So again, do you have all these resources? If I'm talking about resources, it is not just finance. Even human resource, the labor. Do you have what it takes to do all this alone as a new entrant to the sector? That is why we will still encourage that. Having a kind of being part of a value chain and supporting that value chain to work is very, very important. 
So partnership is critical because if you don't do that, what you realize is that, for example, production, you may not be able to get the resources, the tool, the implements to be able to produce throughout the year to ensure that you are always having a supply base. It will be difficult. And if you do all this and you don't, uh, you want to do all this and you don't have the resources, you are going to stretch yourself to a point where you will break down. So why do that alone when you can do that with others to achieve the same goal? Thank you, Nicolas. So we're actually at the end of this session. And I was looking through the messages. If you ask any questions about farm ownership or partnership or collaboration with Complete Farmer, just use the link, please. It's easier for you to register yourself through um, um, the link that it's on the comment section. And if you're trying to use the link and it's not working, please leave your email address and we'll reach back to you. Again, if you also would like to send us an email, our email address is info at completefarmer.com. You send an email and somebody would respond to you with anything that you would like to, um, any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Nicola. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for the time. This was really, really